Um, good afternoon, those of you who are on this side of the Atlantic, and good evening to you, uh, Professor uh, Gardner, who is in Paris, France. Uh, my name is Adam Blackwell. I'm the Vice President International at Development Services Group, and on behalf of the team at the Global Terrorism Trends and Analysis Center, I'll be moderating this session. This is a continuation of a series of talks by eminent people in the field of terrorism, and the views expressed are those of the presenter. The topic today is France and the historical dynamics of terrorism. And as we were just chit-chatting uh, before, this could not come at a better time, as we are seeing coups, evolution, Wagner Group um, active uh, in former French colonies, uh, which concerns us all. Uh, Hal Gardner is a professor and former chair of the Department of History and Politics at the American University of Paris. He's the editor of Geopolitical Turmoil in the Balkans and Eastern Mediterranean, and author of Towards an Alternative Transatlantic Strategy. I'm not going to read all of his publications because there's a, an incredible list here, but what I'm going to do is put um, halgardner.com in the chat, and I would suggest uh, if you would like to go and uh, have a look at his many articles and publications, we'll make them available there. Professor Gardner will speak for about 20 minutes, and then we will have about 20 minutes for Q&A. Please use the Q&A function in Zoom. And I would just ask everybody, please ask a precise question so I can uh, help uh, our presenter uh, uh, navigate uh, what we what I hope will be a uh, dynamic uh, presentation. And I believe, Hal, you've got some good news for us uh, from your perspective as well. So over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, first, let me thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, I spoke last year as well, and I'm honored to speak once again. Um, I'm particularly glad to discuss this issue of France and ter terrorism, only because I've ex lived through some of the terrorist attacks here. In uh, I've never personally had any uh, close contact, but some of my students, um, one of my students' um, uh, girlfriends died in the Bataclan attack, and then uh, one of my students was on the metro that uh, blew up back in 90, 95 or 96 uh, uh, during some of the one wave of terrorist attacks. And I um, 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 particularly, and, and given the fact that we're literally watching the French empire crumble um, on, a, on a weekly basis, uh, I think it's very important to discuss what's happening with the French empire and the interrelationship between terrorism in France and terrorism abroad. So I will, um, uh, and then that's associated with the rise of Russia, China, in, uh, influence in, in, in Africa now. So um, let me um, uh, say that. And then one, one more thing. Um, I'm happy because this research is integrated into my forthcoming book, Reducing the, Ris Re Reducing the Risks of Major Power War, which I just received a, a, a generous grant from the Charles Koch Foundation for. So I hope to finish that um, in the springtime. Um, and um, bring some of the points I made today into that uh, book. Um, now, uh, I only have 20 minutes. I believe me, I have a, a ton of things to say. So I am um, going to uh, speak uh, rather uh, rapidly if I can. I don't like the fact my screen just went blank. So, um, my first point here, I'm going to talk first about the um, immediate post-Cold War uh, France, um, uh, the Algerian um, civil war that resulted uh, in, in major acts of terrorism in France. My basic thesis is that the um, Iran-Iraq war helped stimulate um, Islamist movements around both Shiite and Sunni. Um, and it, it, it caused, uh, for example, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan to be to Islamicize even more than they were to prove that they were Sunni against uh, uh, the um, uh, Iranian Revolution, and that helped generate things. But this was coupled with the collapse of the Soviet Union, which then reduced its support for secular movements such as that in the, the Algerian government. So the Algerian government, by 1992, found itself confronted with the rise of Islamicists. And uh, they staged the 1992 military coup that resulted in the arrest and the internment of thousands of officials from the Islamist Salvation Front. And the problem there was 
democracy was going to put the feast, the uh, uh, Front Islamic Salvation, uh, Islamic Salvation Front, in power. Uh, in the, they won the first round of the parliamentary elections in December 1991. So the government staged a coup to prevent Islamists from coming to power. That this was the first real rise of Islamicism in in in, in the region. So uh, um, uh, as that repression took place, and it was a very vicious repression, uh, and it caused the concerns uh, both in the United States and France uh, as to the, vision, the, the extent of state terrorism used against anti-state terrorism. And so uh, one of the first acts of terrorism, which preceded the attacks on the World Trade Center, was the uh, hijacking of Air France Flight 8969, uh, which uh, hijacked more than 230 passengers and crew, uh, they were taken uh, hostage by four members of the armed Islamic group who were dressed as Algerian policemen who somehow got on board. And this has caused controversy because it's not clear how they were able to do that uh, and it raised issues of whether the Algerian government was actually involved in this and other attacks. So this is one of the issues that, Frank, uh, that President Chirac actually said in public uh, a few years later. Anyway, the uh, attack, maybe some of you saw it on, on television. Uh, the passengers were saved by France's elite GGN. So we, we had a, a, you know, a, a real anti-terrorist uh, uh, force uh, uh, able to uh, combat uh, terrorism. It was quite a, a phenomenal um, takeover of the plane with no, no major injuries. I think the pilot broke his leg. Um, and But what's symbolic about it is that it's, uh, it was forced to stop for refueling in Marseille and the, and the GGN uh, mounted on the plane and got on board. But the, the idea there was either crash it, in the, uh, crash it into the Eiffel Tower or somewhere else. So this was kind of a prelude to the World uh, uh, Trade Center attacks in the, on the Pentagon. So um, I don't want to go into all the details, but then um, uh, after that attack, there were attacks by nail bombs in the French metro. One of my students uh, was on one of those, almost was on one of the trains that was uh, was struck, and and uh, there was uh, um, hundreds of people injured in those attacks and, and and people killed, and they were set off by nail bombs, uh, gas bottle explosion in the Saint Michel station, for example. It's a, the major uh, metro station in, in Paris. Uh, then there was the uh, um, attack on the Trappist Order of Monks. Um, they were held hostage for two months and then found dead. Uh, the government blamed it on the, uh, they, they probably were taken hostage by the armed Islamic group, but they may have been killed actually by the French army firing on them by mistake. Uh, the French, the army, excuse me, the Algerian army firing on them by mistake. And this led to accusations. Of, uh, of, of Algerian incompetence, and also whether or not the Algerians were involved in some of the um, actions um, uh, behind the scenes. So uh, by 1998, Chirac was pre under pressure to intervene militarily in Algeria. Uh, so, some 70,000 people had been killed by then and many more afterwards. Uh, but the problem was the armed Islamic group took credit for many of the attacks both Americans and France nevertheless began to criticize the violent nature of the Algerian repression as state terrorism. And Chirac publicly accused the Algerian government of secretly orchestrating a number of, of the attacks. And part of the reason for the Algerian, possible Algerian or uh, accused Algerian um, involvement was that the Algerian government feared that the US and France would reduce support for the government uh, due to its human rights abuses and the killing of civilians and, 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 uh, and others, Catholic priests. So uh, in this battle between state-supported and anti-state officials, uh, in this battle between state-supported and anti-state terrorism, French officials argued that most of the killings were the work of the armed Islamic group, but that some of them were carried out militia group, by militia groups that the Algerian authorities had, had armed themselves to attack the militants. So th this, was, in my view, was just the beginning of um, the uh, repeated uh, history of um, Islamist um, uh, attacks and, and movements that, that interacted both with the co former French colony and uh, the French metropole. So it had both terrorism in, in Algeria and terrorism to hit the streets of France, uh, literally. Um, now, uh, in many ways, this is all a costly, uh, well, uh, in terms of the next, France was drawn into the next phase of these wars in the aftermath of the um, U.S.-led intervention in Afghanistan. 
the U.S. military intervention in Iraq is not backed by either the U.N. or NATO. The NATO military intervention in Libya, which I'll talk about in more detail, which is strongly backed by France, uh, uh, and uh, and plus the allied U.S., U.K., French, Turkish military intervention and Russian intervention in Syria and Iraq in 2014 against the Islamic State. The problem is all these major military interventions destabilized the countries that, that were attacked and opened the door for many of these movements to thrive on uh, thrive in, in the midst of failed states. Once more, weak states became weaker states and penetrated by uh, radical Islamist groups. Now, France was first, Algeria was the first step, but then it was also drawn into the war on terrorism in Syria. And uh, France may have avoided some major acts of terrorism by not supporting the 2003 US-led military intervention in, in Iraq. Spain, though, was hit by a major Al-Qaeda uh, uh, bombings in Madrid in, in 2004 to, as a warning to get them out of Iraq, and, and they left immediately. Um, uh, and I think uh, France, uh, at least, uh, may have avoided some attacks at that time. But once uh, NATO intervened in Libya in 2011, and as the war on terror spread to Iraq and Syria against the Islamic State, uh, France became a target for major attacks by both al-Qaeda and Islamic State-related groups. Now, uh, the first major attack in France in 2011, the editorial offices of Charlie Hebdo were destroyed in a firebomb attack. Now, that's 2011. Then they would be hit uh, in 2015, in which the entire editorial board and other journalists, about um, uh, 17 people in all, uh, were killed by um, uh, two Algerian brothers. Uh, and, uh, um, and at that time, uh, both uh, Islam, both Al Qaeda and ISIS had, uh, uh, I, I, Islamic State, had threatened to assassinate the editors of Charlie Hebdo or anyone else publishing what they saw as perverse cartoons that depicted the Prophet Muhammad as a terrorist. So both those organizations were probably, at least in the background of these domestic attacks in, in France. Now, these attacks on the Charlie Hebdo, which caused a, a, a national or uh, an international reaction, um, uh, you remember perhaps the protests out on the street. We were all Charlie. Um, um, uh, those uh, were, were involved, uh, engaged much of the community, but they're also uh, highly criticized on a number of grounds. If you want to talk about that in the, in the discussion afterwards, um, but these attacks on Charlie, the Charlie Hebdo edit, uh, editors, uh, were followed by the more extensive November uh, 2015 attacks on the French National Stadium, several restaurants, and the Bataclan Music Club. The latter attacks on the Bataclan uh, uh, killed, well, there were 90 killed at the Bataclan alone, 130 altogether, 416 people injured. Um, only uh, the seven Islamists were killed, uh, and that led to the French major state of emergency that's uh, pretty much in existence uh, now. Um, emergency was declared November uh, 13, 2015. The Islamic State claimed that these attacks represented retaliation for French airstrikes on the Islamic State targets in Syria and Iraq. French President Hollande asserted that these attacks represented an act of war uh, by the so-called Islamic State, and he augmented French airstrikes against Islamic State in retaliation. Uh, 2016, um, uh, the, 2000, uh, the terrorist attack in Nice on Bastille Day was one of the deadliest attacks. A man drove a truck down uh, Main Street in Nice and killed more than 80 people. Uh, friends of mine were on their honey, well, they were celebrating their marriage um, after I don't know how many years, and they watched the whole thing from their, their, um, their, um, their, um, <clears throat> excuse me, their um, uh, hotel. Um, uh, one of my, really horrible, I wrote a poem about it, it's on my website, if anyone looks at it. Four years later, of course, the 2020, October 2020, beheading of the high school teacher, Samuel Patti, he had discussed the Charlie Hebdo cartoons as part of an ethics class to discuss the nature of free speech laws. Uh, this was uh, related to um, uh, uh, some Islamists who um, uh, attacked him and beheaded him on the street. This was a, a, another uh, um, frightening, uh, horrible event. Now, getting to the uh, Libya case, going back to the international, uh, NATO's intervention in France, uh, sorry, NATO's intervention in, war. NATO's intervention in Libya 
was strongly backed by France itself. But Paris at that time would have preferred that the operation would have been an all European and not a NATO command. But NATO members said it wasn't going to, I mean, in the US said it wouldn't do it unless it was under NATO. Um, so the, the, this is an interesting uh, in, internal um, inter, inter allied uh, debate that's going on. But anyway, the problem is the intervention not only destabilized Libya, it further destabilized much of the Sahel region as much many of France's uh, former colonies um, uh, uh, became destabilized and Mali became the first. Um, so, uh, you know, Gaddafi himself was obviously seen as a, as a, a state uh, support a state terrorist. Uh, he he had supported uh, uh, the Red Army faction, the Red Brigades, the Irish Republican Army. Plus, he opposed uh, Gulf monarchies, uh, and he supported efforts to unify uh, Africa against uh, uh, the Arab Gulf interests. Um, so uh, the overthrow of Gaddafi was supported uh, by not not only the U.S. Europeans but also the Arab Gulf monarchies in general, in particular uh, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. Um, well, uh, furthermore, he had uh, ordered the bombing of the commercial airliner um, uh, over Lockerbie, Scotland, and of course that that pretty much sealed his fate. Now, um, the problem is that the military intervention not only destabilized Libya, but French allies in the region. Uh, so now, Libya, after this uh, military on the one hand libya is under divided control of the un supported government government of national accord in tripoli uh and versus the tobruk based house of representatives at the same time much of the country because it's now a, a completely uh, devastated state much of the territory is actually governed by al-qaeda linked terrorist group ansar al saria that was allegedly responsible for the attack on the u.s consulate in 2012 as well as the Islamic State or, or Daesh. <clears throat> Both organizations are using Libya as one of their hubs, in addition to Syria and Iraq, among other countries, to mount wider regional terrorist attacks, which have included France as a target, as I just mentioned, but also a number of African countries now. And so so <clears throat> this instability, not only did, for, because of this instability in the region after Gaddafi um, was overthrown, I'll explain that in a second, France had to intervene in Mali in 2013. Uh, it also intervened with airstrikes in September 14 in Iraq and Syria at the end of 2015. So all these airstrikes aimed at um, Islamic State uh, end up spreading Islamic State in, into new directions. Um, the collapse of the Libyan regime had led to the flow of conventional arms from Libyan stockpiles into Mali and the general region. The infl then there was an influx of Islamist groups into northern Mali, and this reignited the Dormic Tuareg re rebellion in 2012, which had uh, a movement that had previously arisen in 1963, 1990, and 2006. So by January 2013, France was impelled to intervene in Mali in Operation Surveil. This was a successful operation. Um, uh, President Holland was really praised for engaging in it. He was seen as a hero in Mali at that time, uh, in this, because in the short run, Operation Surveil was able to clear Islamist movements from their urban stronghold hold in the Islamic Emirate of Northern Mali. They formed a separate um, uh, region, separate Islamist state there. But in the long run, the pro prolonged conflict called Operation Barkhand resulted in Malian political opposition and French troop withdrawal in 2022. Now, furthermore, um, not only Mali is affected, but violent Islamist attacks have increased nearly seven times in Burkina Faso, Faso Western Nigeria, as well as Mali, uh, more so than any other region in Africa during that period. Um, and uh, where France also has military presence in Senegal and Djibouti, uh, there have been uh, a number of Islamist attacks there. Um, so ironically, uh, uh, this has led a number of African countries, including Central African Republic, uh, Libya, at least uh, the one faction of the Libyan um, government, uh, Mali and Sudan have all turned to Russia and the Wagner Group to fight against Islamist groups, of course, raising questions for American and French global strategies, how to deal with, with these both Islamicism and the influence of Russia. Now, just for some statistics here, in just the first six months of 2023, West Africa recorded over 8 
1,500 terrorist attacks between January and June 2023. Um, uh, the 4,593 deaths have occurred uh, in the region in, in overall. I don't know. Uh, and the entire, these conflicts in this region, in, in the Sahel region, um, particularly uh, in the, um, uh, have displaced as many as 2.6 million people uh, or and two in uh, the Lip Depkau Gurma region and 2.8 million in the Lake Chad Basin, with hundreds of thousands of refugees pouring into neighbor neighboring countries. So uh, th this has um, begun. This alienation from France has led these powers to look to Russia, Turkey, and China. They are turning away. They're trying to turn away from the uh, French currency, French back currency, the France they far. Uh, and uh, uh, try to open their economies to new new influence, but this this brings them into potential dependence on China in particular. Well, um, let me go on to France today, and then I'll try to finish up and ask you can ask me any questions. I'm covering a lot of ground here. Uh, Fr France's domestic tariff, terrorist threat is presently at the medium level. Reinforced security risk of attack attacks can occur. Uh, at any time in this in this warning. This is because Al-Qaeda has warned both Sweden and France that attacks are forthcoming. At the same time, uh, um, the French have claimed that they have broken up at least 42 terrorist uh, attempts this year alone. Why are Al-Qaeda warnings coming now? First is the, it come in the wake of trials held in the June 20, 20, June 2022 of Islamists accused of coordinating the Bataclan attacks and the National Stadium attacks uh, that I mentioned earlier. All 20 defendants were found guilty by the French court. On the domestic side, the French have once again acted against uh, Islamic uh, symbols uh, and, uh, um, and uh, attacks could be rationalized by Al-Qaeda, ISIS, or other Islamists, as well as by lone wolves acting alone because the French decided to ban the traditional abaya in public schools in 2023. This is just a few weeks ago. Uh, France had already banned Muslim headscarves in public schools in 2004 and then passed a ban on full face, full face veils in public in 2010. Uh, this, this issue is on top of the crisis or the um, major uh, riots that took place in the French uh, banlieue or the impoverished suburbs in July 2023. Uh, the major issue in those protests was reaction against perceived discrimination, pr pr police brutality under and under under an unemployment. Uh, at that time, uh, similar protests, major protests had taken place in 2005. So given the differences in values, many French Muslims feel marginalized and disenfranchised in French society, even though they are French citizens, they do not see themselves as socially politically equal. So I can go into the, the, I don't think I have time to go into the history of uh, uh, the French immigration uh, uh, question, but uh, the big issue in the long term is Muslims are estimated to represent four to five percent of the nation's overall population, but in metropolitan area of France, they reach around 10 percent. And though statistics are difficult to prove, the Pew Research Center has predicted the Muslim population could rise from around 7 million or 8.6 million to about uh, no, to, to, from 7 million to 8.6 million, or about 12% of the entire country by 2050. So this, this raises real questions of how the French are going to integrate um, uh, the, the, these, these groups. And just to, let me end on this comment. One of the protests against the Abaya really wasn't about the Abaya itself, but the fact that um, uh, one, one student said, for months and months, we had no teachers as there were no replacements, but they found time for this to worry, you know, to worry about the abaya. And another one said, we are not waiting for ministries to tell us how to dress. We are waiting for ministries who give us the tools to provide our children some serenity that gives our teachers the best tools. Um, so, I mean, the, the problem is this problem of discrimination is, is perceived, and, and I think uh, wrongly, uh, it's it's manipulated by Islamic movements for sure, uh, but the real problem is uh, is the feeling of discrimination, and th this has led the right wing political groups 
uh, see these the protests in, in 2023 and other uh, attacks as being fueled by Islamo Goshism or um, um, leftist Islamic uh, alliance. Uh, and the idea here, uh, the fear of the French, and it, it's not entirely, it's not a, um, it's, it's it's a real a real thing. Uh, this idea that Islamists are trying to separate from the values of the French Republic and French society and what's been called Islamic separatism, uh, and it's not merely ideological because if you've gone to some of these areas in France, they are no man's land. The um, the French police officials cannot enter because uh, they are controlled by local gangs, drug dealers, and and mafias. So. Um, um, and finally, my last remark, um, just to throw it out, uh, is one dimension of the crisis in the French, between the French and its Muslim population, really it, it's a, the historical bias of, the, of France against religion in general. And it's a, a general attitude towards all religions, including Catholicism, and not just Islam alone. And the major dilemma stems from France's unique revolutionary history, that makes it very difficult for the France, French to deal with religion in general and Islam in particular. The French Revolution initially uh, sought to de-Christianize France by establishing a deistic religion, if not abolish religion altogether during the reign of terror in 1793-1794. And at that time, French ideologues justified the use of terrorism by the state as a violent action intended to achieve a greater public good. Now, one more point, Islamicism is not the only threat. Uh, in June uh, 2023, right-wing suspects of the so-called Barjols movement were put on trial when they were uh, accused of or suspected of uh, preparing an attempt on President Macron's life in 2018 at the time of the Yellow Vest protest. This is an extreme right-wing nationalist and anti-immigration group that was formed on Facebook in 2017 and held secret meetings. So, um, you know, France is not, what I'm saying here is France is not only uh, confronted with uh, Islamist movements that are linked to uh, Islamist movements abroad, uh, increasingly, uh, we mentioned Algeria, but uh, I believe uh, Western Africa will also be, uh, and, and Syria and Iraq, but Western Africa as well and as well as right-wing groups that are opposing um, uh, immigration into the country. And the immigrants themselves uh, are going to have a hard time, or the France are going to have a, France is going to have a hard time trying to in integrate them into French society if they cannot provide uh, the basics for education and, and, and jobs. So I'll, I'll leave it there. And uh, I, I had a lot of material. I went through it fairly fast. So um, I hope that was clear anyway. Uh, thanks very much, Hal. Yeah, you're right. It's um, it's it's quite a complicated, complex uh, environment, and um, we did ask you to go through a huge amount of material very quickly. So uh, we're we're very grateful for that. Uh, just to remind everybody, please put your questions in the Q and A function in Zoom. I will read them as quickly as I can, and um, uh, and turn them over to our uh, expert. So the first question, Hal, is. Yes. Uh, how has France not been able to capitalize on recent victories, such as eliminating the leader of Al Qaeda in the in the Maghreb yeah, in February yeah. of twenty two? Yeah, um, it seemed poised to that partner in fighting terrorism groups in the region, or were events like these just lucky exceptions uh, of their intervention in West Africa and the Sahel? Well, uh, my my view is that uh, you, you decapitate the the rule, or somebody just takes their place. And uh, um, so it, it's a it's a, obviously a, a victory uh, for, for a short period of time. And it, it probably uh, it, it destabilizes the group, of course, uh, at least until they can recover with a new leadership. So um, I think that's it. But the, the, the real the real issue here is just the extent of the political, economic, social crisis that the whole region is facing. I mean, the irony here, I, I'm not, I never was a Gaddafi supporter, but he warned uh, that you, you you overthrow me and all hell is going to break loose because he was, his idea of um, of, uh, of a unifying Africa under his uh, hegemony uh, was bringing uh, these groups under his control. Uh, by eliminating him, he, it, it opened the door to um, ISIS and Al-Qaeda to enter uh, when, when he was actually against those groups. 
So the irony is you overthrew one terrorist. I'm not, as I said, he, he was responsible for a hell of a lot of uh, violence, but then you open the door for, for new terrorists. So that's my answer to that, that question. In an earlier life, we often found that um, taking out the head of a cartel um, was actually kind of counterintuitive in that you would create five heads of five different cartels. Yeah, exactly, and, and that's what's... Of, that's what's happened in Mexico, and uh, it, it, well, I, there's actually parallels between the, the war on terrorism and, and the war on drugs uh, between Central America and, and Africa, and they both didn't fall the wrong way. Um, again, remind everybody, please put your questions in the Q&A function of Zoom. The next question is really centered around prisons oh, mm -hmm. um, as being a pathway to... Um, radicalize and you know it's often been blamed in france as as creating an environment uh that helps transform uh criminals to terrorists so you know you've got this hybrid of half criminal half terrorist um is the radical is this radicalization in prison st still an issue and if it is what should the government be doing about it well uh, it definitely is an issue uh french prison conditions are awful um and um I, I did. I, I have a. I have a little bit on that on another thing. But France is beginning the de-radicalization program, where, where they try to to bring in imams and uh, give a moderate imam, and they're trying to reduce the number of radical Islamist um, imams that have uh, been brought to France over the years without control. So there, that, that was one problem. They weren't there, for years. There was no control over what kind of imams would enter the country, and, and um, Turkey was funding some of them. The Gulf states were funding others, but uh, they, they were coming from areas the, that there was no control over necessarily control over who was preaching. So that's one issue. And then in the prisons, uh, the, you know, the treatment prison treatment itself uh, creates cells where the, each um, each group. Uh, um, uh, Islamic group or, or other other ideologically ideologically inclined uh, people join. So the problem is how to break that, and I don't think anybody has any any clue on that right now. But but there has been de-radicalization de attempts to um, uh, show a path towards integration into society, uh, and it's worked in a number of cases. It's not a total loss, but I I, I don't have the statistics right in front of me. But uh, I, I don't want to quote the wrong figure. It's on another piece of paper here. Um, uh, the, 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 there's been a, a, some success, but there's also been some some of those who were released um, um, uh, became uh, uh, criminals or, or, or terrorists again. So it's not a total thing. But the, the other issue related to this is the, um, the number of um, people who have trained abroad and they're afraid of them coming back. Um, um, and uh, um, France itself was a major supplier of foreign far fighters to Syria and Iraq. Um, in 2013, more than 700 French citizens joined pan-Islamist movements. By 2016, the number was 2,000. Those people coming back become threats to the society. And uh, um, the idea is uh, to, um, as I said, to engage them if they're known who they are and uh, if they're let into the country in the first place, which is another another issue. Um, the next question is really around discrimination of, of the Muslim people. Yeah. Um, and is it a leading factor in the tensions between Islamic and Western countries? Um, the, the question, uh, you know, understands that there are power politics at play. Um, but the regional aspect of things, it seems that the discrimination of Muslim culture and tradition is harboring more anger and resentment towards the Western world. And if this, mm -hmm. if you believe this to be the case, uh, how do we, you suggest we repair this um, uh, to help alleviate the tensions? Well, I'll, I'll give you a funny answer to this. I mean, um, you know, everybody's heard about the burkini and, you know, France tried to ban the burkinis. This is the full swimming suit that women wear. Um, they can't wear bikinis. They wear burkinis. And, and the irony of that is um, uh, the bikini was banned when it, the French women were uh, were fine for wearing the bikini way back when. So uh, France had first put a lot of pressure. We're not going to let you wear burkinis, et cetera. Now, now, 
that's died down a little bit. So there's a general acceptance of a woman wants to go swimming, she can go in the bikini. But in the French swimming pool, you have to wear a Speedo. Now that actually called protests in, in Muslim communities. I don't like wearing Speedos in, in French bathing uh, in public pools. It's just a, a totally ludicrous phenomena that creates resentment where there doesn't have to be resentment, if you follow me. This is a minor example. But if you live through this and you're constantly discriminated against because you can't get a job because your name is this and, and you don't speak quite French quite properly, which is really a major issue here, um, you don't get a job. So discrimination is a reality that's very hard for the French to come. It's just part of the bureaucracy. The French are very stubborn. And I mean, the stupid rule about Speedos, for me, is just sim so symbolic of the French inability to realize there might be some other alternatives besides wearing Speedos that offend some people. Um, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it's a, it sounds a lot maybe a, a off the uh, mark, but it's for my, uh, that, the one thing I've noticed personally, um, uh, and but I know uh, from uh, students and others uh, who have been discriminated against, uh, uh, and it's mainly around l language and uh, finding jobs. Now, the, the headscarves, the, the other rule here that the French, I, I mentioned that France is historically anti um, religious to begin with. But to moderate that, it, the French have had to make concessions to the Catholic Church over time after Napoleon and, and the 19th centuries, and they, they uh, created their um, uh, laïcité, the, the laws of related to the state and the religion. And here, uh, the problem with the baya is it's seen as a, f a religious, uh, a religious um, dress. While you are aware, allowed to wear kippahs or um, small crosses, uh, you can't wear large pub, uh, large abayas. And this is, as I said, some the, the number of women, it wasn't very many, 70 people have refused to go to school, refused not to, um, refused to uh, take them off um, and were kicked out of the school the first day, uh, something like that. Um, I have the figure there anyway. Um, but the problem with it, as I said, why are they so worried about the the outside when they haven't got the the teachers and the real tools for these kids to to move up in French society and, and to learn French properly, et cetera, like that? So so that's the kind of issue that's going on where discrimination uh, is seen as um, uh, really deeper than the religious issue here. I, I I really think that if they didn't feel discriminated against. The Islamists couldn't play with uh, and manipulate that that feeling of discrimination. No, I have to say on a personal note, I just watched a brilliant show on TV Saint, which is the only French television really we get here in yeah, the United yeah. States. And um, it was an association created by the father of one of the victims of Bataclan and the father right. of one of the perpetrators. And right. they had an incredibly rich story and we're trying to weave together um, other participants. And it seemed that this was probably more uh, of a positive way to move forward than uh, than harboring the anger of the past. No, no, it's a dialogue between the two different sides is always uh, the way to move forward. And um, getting that dialogue, of course, is difficult, but you can, you can good, uh, good groups can, can, can bring that forward and then uh, expand it to, to different parts of the community. And, um, this is the next question is perhaps related to your speedo um, yeah. uh, law. Yeah. Would a re-embracing of religion on the part of the French government do anything to reduce tensions with uh, with Islamic uh, French or the French Islamic population? Would uh, it have any traction with French people with the French? Well, people? it's you know as I said, France is uh, uh, you know one of the issues here uh, also was uh, uh, France defends the right to blasphemy. Uh, and so the Charlie Hebdo cartoons, if you've ever seen them, are just grotesque. I mean, people stop reading Charlie Hebdo. The irony is the Islamic killing of the editors actually boosted the, the readership of Charlie Hebdo, but it's going back down to where it was. It's around 70,000 70, now readers. Uh, and it went up to several million immediately after the, uh, 7 million, I think, after the attacks. So, you know, I... I I always found them gross and vulgar, um, whether they were insulting uh, Catholicism or Islam or, or, or whatever. I just never found them very funny. So, um, but it's part of French um, culture because of the French Revolution to accept blasphemy 
um, uh, as a uh, as a, 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 a given right. So, so the idea um, of uh, I mean, the French claim religious tolerance and a treatment of equality to all uh, religions. So I can't see them changing um, in that that particular approach. However, as I said, uh, uh, trying to uh, address the questions of of discrimination. I mean, these riots in, in two, July 2023 were really extensive. They went into uh, uh, department stores, devastated, stole TV sets, whatever. It, 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 I mean, you, we, we've had the same thing in Watts and, and uh, in Chicago and elsewhere, different periods of U.S. history. It's very similar. Uh, but uh, um, uh, the point is that that, the, that that to me is the real way to move. Uh, the religious question um, uh, the, the French uh, aren't going to adopt any kind of uh, religious position uh, it, uh, as a state. Uh, the, the laicite is going to stay the, the rule. Um, are we, go the next question is, are we going to witness a new wave of Islamic extremism in Europe, um, especially in countries like Sweden and Germany, uh, due to the high number of refugees? We're already starting to see this polarization on the yeah. of the extreme right. Right. Well, I see. I see the threat there from the extreme right. Uh, as I, uh, Germany, uh, um, I just mentioned the French uh, had to the Barjos movement. Uh, the French have just put those guys on trial uh, for their um, uh, suspected preparation attempt on Macron. And in Germany, uh, just um, uh, there was a coup attempt. Um, uh, they had uh, um, they cracked down on. Uh, uh, hold on here. Uh, yeah, they um, uh, they had this in July 2022. Federal uh, the Germans uh, had 3,000 officers conducting researches at 130 sites in 11 of Germany's 16 states uh, to uh, against the adherence of the of the Reich citizens movement. So this <laughs> this is not a little uh, a little group like the one in France. Um, uh, now they detained some 22 German citizens, some Russians, and some others that were seen as um, um, you know, forming a terrorist organization with the goal of overthrowing the existing state in Germany, um, et cetera. So um, you've got those movements reacting to the immigrants, and then you have uh, the influx. You've, you had this tremendous uh, influx. Of, I think 6,000, 7,000 uh, immigrants showed up on the island of Lampedusa just the other week, and some of them have already apparently dispersed into the into the woodwork. How many of those are terrorists and how many are are just guys looking for a job. I, I saw one sneak across the Italian border. I had no idea. I was in the, my train, sitting in the train, and there was a giant ski bag in front of me. The police walked by, the dogs went by, and as he got into the knees, the bag zipped open and he jumped out. I mean, it, it was amazing. And I don't know how, you know, dogs didn't sniff him or anything. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, th this is happening every day uh, across the borders, um, uh, you know, and they're desperate. Uh, they, they usually want to get to the UK. They don't want to stay in France. It's ironic, um, uh, but that's another story. But the point is, yeah, um, um, and I think um, as, as Sarkozy, President Sarkozy just said the other day, the wave of immigration hasn't even begun. Uh, the destabilization of Africa is so severe with rising young people without jobs. Uh, they're prey for terrorists. And... Uh, um, this is why I've argued in my book um, uh, on um, U.S. Um, U.S. and Europe uh, towards an alternative transatlantic strategy for a joint U.S.-European program to develop those areas of Africa and Central America that are causing these waves of immigration. The roots get to the roots of where these the guys are, and young people are coming from to try to. Uh, keep them at home with decent decent work and uh, and prevent them from wanting to to leave their homelands and and go to Europe or the United States. Uh, I don't I only see a, a combination of the US and Europe working together to really um, prevent this crisis from from getting much worse than it already is. Now we have a couple more questions for you. One, which is very much in the vein of what we were talking about a little bit before the presentation. Um, is the recent wave of coups in West Africa yeah. more to do with the discontent of the former governments rather than Russian and Islamic uh, terrorist influence? Um, and do we see these new junta governments making deals with terrorists or trying to fight these groups? 
Well, they, they say they're trying to fight them, and they claim that the Wagner groups are, are is more, I guess they see them as more brutal and uh, more willing to do whatever they want them to do or act on their own, uh, even if it means killing civilians. Um, and therefore, um, uh, they support uh, Wagner. They're definitely against, um, uh, and what just happened is that uh, um, uh, while we, um, hold on here, I get my notes in front of me. Um, uh, Mal Mali, um, Burkina Faso, and Niger have just signed a mutual defense pact, an alliance of Sahel states, they call it, to establish an architecture of collective defense uh, combining military and economic efforts to protect the Liptako Gorma region, um, where the Mali, Bur Burkina Faso, Niger borders meet. And that defense alliance is both against Islamists and against uh, any threat by the ECOWAS, the Union of African States, to attack them as they have threatened to do to overthrow these dictatorships. So, um, um, you know, the situation there is really growing much worse. I mentioned the statistics of, of terrorist attacks, 1,800 terrorist attacks just this first six months this year. And the main problem is that the coastal countries of the Gulf of Guinea are experiencing regular Salifa or uh, hottest attacks on their military posts on the northern border, border, as well as on remote villages, trying to bring them into um, under their control. So uh, um, the borderlands and the uh, are, are becoming uh, and, and the coastal states are becoming the upper the, the areas of opportunity for the Islamist movements to to move into. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm seeing a polarization within polarization. So, I mean, uh, the, the the other African states are rejecting France, but they're also uh, polarizing among themselves. So, um, um, it's a it's a really dangerous situation. In that so, as we have been pivoting back and forth, we're going to stay on the international, um, and then I'll come back to uh, France domestic. Um, how do you think Chinese investment in Africa will shape some of these international relationships? Yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, like, there was an American, I uh, know he's a South African, I guess, but he made a joke about how much money the Chinese were giving, uh, giving Africa. I remember in one of his, um, kind of, I'm sorry, I'm blanking out his name. Um, the, the, the Chinese are entering there, but they're doing it on their own terms. This is uh, very worrisome. It creates a dependency for the African states if they can't pay it back pay back the loans. And the Chinese bring in their own workers. Uh, so they're not really employing people. They're really just buying off the elites in order to, to move in there. So it's, it's a new form of um, imperialism, in my view. Um, so, so uh, but it brings them money. So it looks good, at least on the surface, until it has to be paid back. And then if they can't pay it back, uh, the Chinese will swap uh, territory and, and, and resources, et cetera. Uh, so it's a, in the long term, it's a bad deal. But, you know, the Chinese model is different than the IMF model, the so-called Washington consensus, where we try to get them to, to uh, reduce government spending and reduce wages and other things in order to balance their, their budgets. Uh, the Chinese don't do that. So uh, um, it's a real. Um, uh, and then the, they complain, the African states are complaining about being uh, dependent on Western finance, IMF, et cetera. Uh, and therefore are looking to Russia, to, uh, Turkey, and, and China, as you said, uh, for alternative um, um, alternative funding. Uh, but that has political strings attached. So uh, as I said earlier, it's in many ways, it's, it's like Imperial Germany trying to get into the uh, colonial uh, race at the right before World War I. Um, China, China is in many ways the new Imperial Germany. Uh, Someone else. Um, I'm going to try and link our last question together. This goes back, pivots okay. back to domestic France. So according to our data, France is recording more jihadist attacks by loan actors than other EU actors. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and this could be because of the discrimination and lack of integration of Northern Africans. Um, but the other piece to this is there are allegations that mosques and Islamic centers 
um, especially some of those controlled by other Middle Eastern countries, has evolved into centers of radicalization in Europe, um, and especially in France. Uh, how do you see these two uh, issues uh, evolving, emerging? Yeah, um, well, I agree with you. Lone wolves are, are really dangerous. You just don't know when they're going to strike. Uh, I mean, people forget about the the lone wolf uh, uh, fascist who who killed, uh, I think, in um, uh, again, was it back in Sweden or Norway? Um, uh, but again, the the name at the moment. Uh, uh, that's on the right wing side, but on the Islamist side, uh, uh, any destabilized person who's destabilized for whatever reason, lack of job, uh, mental instability, whatever, uh, can easily uh, uh, be um, uh, not recruited, but influenced by the internet and other things. So th that I see is a is a problem we really can't do much about, except. Uh, people uh, in France has a, a de denunciation thing where you can denounce people now in the, in the new terrorist uh, law. So you tell, if you see somebody acting suspiciously, you can call the police. Um, but no, that, I don't think that solves that problem. The real problem is the is the mosque. But the French have, uh, at least in the last couple of years, tried to control where the, the preachers are coming from and, and making sure that uh, the mosques are not, as I said earlier, there was no controls for, for many years over who was preaching in the mosques. And uh, that that the French have at least been looking at. Furthermore, they're trying to create a, a pact of, with, of is, with the Islamic community. It's not, we, we mentioned uh, a turn to religion. It's it's not exactly that. It's it's a, a, a pact between a, 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 a national Islam is what um, Macron has been talking about. What are the the standards for Islamic uh, religion inside of France. Uh, and, and maybe I misunderstood the question before, but that's what the French are moving uh, to to create uh, under Macron. And they, 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 it, it, he, he entered in, well, the government entered into a debate with different Islamist leaders in order to uh, try to set the, uh, the, the, the regulations of a French Islam. What is to be worn? What, what is the proper uh, uh, religious... Uh, uh, attire, et cetera. Um, and uh, that has difficult, a lot of criticisms, but as, as, as far as I know, it's been moving forward fair, uh, fairly rapidly. But that in itself is seen as a co-optation process by the radicals who then react and say, you guys are selling out. So, you, you know, it, it, it's a very, um, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a long-term uh, deal to really bring this to any kind of end. And it's not going to end soon. Well, Hal, that brings us to the end of uh, this version of the speaker series. I'd like to thank you for a very uh, interesting presentation and lively discussion. I'd like to thank everybody who's listening um, for your questions and your attention. I think that, you know, you've highlighted uh, a topic and we've been talking about both the domestic and the international angles of this, which are uh, very, very germane to the discussions taking place uh, actually today at the uh, United, United Nations General Assembly. So uh, this has been uh, incredibly important and incredibly timely. So uh, thank well, you. Thank you again, again for inviting me. I really appreciate it and hope to do another one. And for everybody who's listening, this will be it has been recorded and will be posted to our website. And uh, we're looking to do another uh, session on Africa in the not too distant future. So thanks again, Hal, and thanks uh, to everybody listening, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again. Bye-bye.